I don't think I ever, I don't know if I ever killed anybody. I can't say that and I really don't want to brag about it, so. I would never have forgot it. It's like those, all those guys that drowned that day. I never forgot that. I don't know. That stays with me forever. In fourth grade, I was, uh, uh, when the war started, and then uh, uh, World War II. I got out of grade school in 45, 46 year, 45, 46, and that's when uh, that war ended. So, but during the war, we, you know, everybody was on uh, uh, rations. You had, everybody had a ration book. You couldn't, you, hate, you only got so much sugar per person. And, and I don't know what other food it was, flour or, I can't remember, but, um, uh, and then tires for a car, you couldn't get a tire if you wanted one. It had so many boots in the tire to plug the holes and cracks, and so we finally got a couple of tires, and then, <coughs> and, and then the, um, when I got to high school, <coughs> I started high school in uh, 45, 46 year, <coughs> and my brother was two years ahead of me, so he was now a junior. And uh, we, all, we all got through high school, and, and there was all, uh, brother and I were good in the sports for, for Harlem. And, uh, and he, as soon as he got out of high school, he, he took off. He didn't like working for nothing. So, <laughs> but when I got to be a, a senior, we had a 49-50 basketball team. Uh, our pitchers are out there on the wall. We never lost a game in conference, undefeated season. That's never happened here yet, as far as basketball. Yeah. So our pitchers are out there, our, the team. And Clyde Peterson was our coach. Well, when I got to be a senior, I graduated in 1950. And that's <clears throat> in 1950, on a day of my birthday, Korean War started, 25th of June. And I think, oh, boy. On Sunday, June 25th, Communist forces attacked the Republic of Korea. This attack has made it clear beyond all doubt that the international communist movement is willing to use armed invasion to conquer independent nations. An act of aggression such as this, it creates a very real danger to the security of all free nations. After World War II, the United Nations had to determine what would become of Korea, since it had previously been completely occupied by the Japanese. The UN eventually came to the conclusion that Korea would be divided into two separate halves along the 38th parallel. The northern half would become a communist state under the control of the Soviet Union, and the southern half would become occupied by America. But on June 25, 1950, North Korean forces crossed the 38th parallel in order to invade South Korea. The United Nations decided to intervene in the conflict, although mostly American forces were used to help South Korea. This event became known as the beginning of the Korean War. About 18 months later, I got greetings from the service. You know, they wanted, they wanted it. I remember the day I left, because I was, I was never as wreck. I couldn't eat. I was going to leave. I'd never run away from a house before. So I had to go to Chicago to take a physical, and they, I passed. So, and this is before, this is about October, November of 51. And, I, and I, right after Christmas, they let me stay home for Christmas, and right after Christmas, I had to go in, just, just report in and go to Chicago. And they shipped us down to uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky for a training. I remember at uh, boot camp, uh, I was with a good friend. We got drafted together, and we were in the same company down in the, uh, and not the same platoon, but he was next building next to me, and uh, I'd, I'd get so uh, shook up, I'd have to go over there and see him. 
just to talk, you know, to somebody I knew. Was, uh, yeah, but he was my helper, if you want to say, uh, my helper, you know. Keep me from going uh, a little berserk. So I had six weeks of uh, infantry training, six weeks of tank training, and then uh, after that was done, we I come home for a week, and then we they sent me off to uh, uh, the East uh, California. So I thought, oh, I know where I'm going. So I was in California maybe a week and got on a ship and headed for Japan. We spent probably a week there and got on another ship and headed for Korea. And when they got to Korea, you know, they handed us a, a, a rifle because we were now going to have to get on a landing craft and uh, right by Seoul uh, on the Inji River. And so they didn't tell us nothing where we were going. You could hear a lot of sh firing going on. It was dark and no ammunition. We had a weapon, but no ammunition. And I don't remember how, where I went then, but I know, uh, I think they must have put us in a, some tent somewhere, but I got sick. And uh, I had a fever 105, and it had to be 105 degrees there, because, boy, I was in misery. And they finally put me in a hospital in Seoul. I think it was Seoul, I'm not sure, but. I laid in the bed and I look up and know there was no roof on this place. They had been blown off. Uh, and I laid in this hospital for probably a week and it's, of course now my company's gone on and I got to try to catch up to them because uh, I was uh, uh, going to be a track mechanic for armored vehicles. So when I uh, got caught back my company, they got me in a truck and hauled me back to my company and they were in reserve right then, back off the line a couple of miles for a rest. And when I got there, well, there was no job for me. So they stuck me in the tank. And at, in the meantime, the driver went home, so I had to move over to the driver's seat, which is on the left side. And the driver <clears throat> has a big responsibility. He has to keep this tank running. We never want to break down in combat. And his job is to be mechanically, and I was mechanically, so I, was, I had no trouble with my tanks. I never had a breakdown. During that time, we was on the, on the uh, reserve. We was right along a river. We parked the tanks down on the river, and we'd drive in the water and wash them, you know, because you had to be clean, you know, shiny and all that, so. But one day, we, we had rain for probably five days in a row, and, and we had to, they told us to better move our tanks back up out of the, out of that, off, off the sand and get them back up higher, because uh, the water was getting higher in the river. And then one day, I'll never forget this, it was the worst, worst thing that ever happened to me, is to see the, the, the easy, uh, easy Company was across the river training, because it, it was a 279 company I was in. And this is part of our company was the infantry plus a tank company. It's not like a tank battalion, it's a tank company within the infantry. We had uh, uh, four tanks per platoon, so we had about 18 tanks. One, one retriever tank and one dozer tank and a flamethrower tank. And so we were down there moving the tanks and, and then the, the water started coming up real fast and we looked down the river and here come up. A truck had dumped over in the river with all these soldiers in it, with their ponchos on and out their rifles and all their equipment. Dumped the truck over because it's on a pontoon bridge, because normally you can drive through it. Had to get a pontoon bridge in there to get them across back home. Well, it tipped these took two tipped two trucks over, and these guys are coming down the river with all this gear on, floating, and we we're standing right here with nothing we could do. Floating along pretty soon. 
they're gone. So I was 30, I'm not sure of the count, I think it was 30 some soldiers gone, just like that. And man, that, that's something I never, ever forgot. It was tough on me. I was kind of homesick anyway. You know, I'd never been away from the farm. I wrote uh, letters as, as often as I could, and I, I know she's, I still got them. She had them all rubber band around them. Yeah, still got them. I never told her. I was in combat. I never, I never mentioned that. Uh, there was no point, you know. So I didn't. I never told her I was over there fighting, you know. I was just driving the tank, you know. <laughs> so we went back uh, after that. We went back up to the line in a different spot, and uh, we have to. Uh, uh, if you park in a position that the other tank come out of, you're sitting right on the front line, the infantry trenches are right here. You're looking down or looking up on the, on the hills next. It's really hilly there. And that, trying to get a tank up in those positions because the roads were so narrow that sometimes the guys have to get out just to drive you in there because you don't know if you're going to slip off. You get up the front line, and we had a, you have to stay in your tank, uh, two guys in there all night because uh, people, the Chinese especially, would like to sneak up on you. Uh, and the front line was lit up at night because we only seemed like we only fought at night. Uh, they had those big lights that they used to have at the carnivals, you know, when they to draw people. They were all along the back of the line. Back, probably, they probably back, I don't know how far back they were, but they were shining the lights that we could always see at night. Just always see. And, uh, and they had, always had smoke. They blow in smoke all the time. It's like a fog. We were up there. We stay up there. I think we and we live in uh, some of the guys. Two guys in the tank at night, and, and the other three guys are in a, a a bunker, sandbag bunker, right next to the tank. And uh, you, they have to be dressed. You have to be ready to go in case something happens. You know. And then uh, it's sitting there all night in that tank, and Korea was so cold. They never told us how cold it got, but we'd hear rumors it was 30 to 40 below. I knew I had, I had two sleeping bags, one inside the other, plus all my clothes on. You didn't take your clothes off at night. You had to, you had to uh, sleep in them or eat up all night anyways, if you're in a tank and it's cold in there, there's no heat. Uh, and the tank has a uh, generator. It has a little generator because to try to start these tanks at night, you know, or when it's cold, you got to have the booster. So with having that generator, I think, well, I can run, I can run wires in there. We can run the generator now and then keep, keep the batteries up and have lights and, and got a, uh, and the tanks were running on 100 octane fuel. So uh, I, we had a, I don't know where we got this thing. We had the old blowtorch. Put the, 100 octane fuel in a voltage, and you blow it in a coffee can, a tin for heat. Boy, to heat that bunker up real good. <laughs> After we pulled back from that position, went back in reserve at a different area. Uh, for a reserve, we have to do a lot of inspections, and, the and I work on the tank, and I and the big generals come around, and they want to see the tanks and want to. You know, I showed them my tank first because I had a, I, they wanted to see the engine, so I uncovered the engine and had this big, big engine in there and I had it, I polished it all the time. Thing with, uh, I, mean, I never told me what I used, but I used shoe polish. <laughs> so I, this tank engine was like spotless and this guy, the generals come over and said, man. So I, they, my tank was always a show tank. And uh, we went back up in the front line again. We could watch the uh, airplanes coming in bombing. They, uh, they never used the, the, the jets weren't used up close to infantry and uh, along the front line because you could see the people, the enemy. Some places they're only 50 yards away from you. So you could see the trenches, you know, and, and 
in our, our trenches, and we fired that big cannon off where the infantry was ready to give us a man. Don't do that, because you shoot that big gun off, and we get all the stuff coming back. If they shoot back on us, and the infantry, poor infantry guys, they didn't like us, so. So we come back, and then this time we went back off, off the front line, went back, and they sent us to, they split the company in two, took half the tanks and half the infantry, and sent us to uh, Kojido Island, uh, which is an island about 20 miles in the Yellow Sea off the coast, just a little, little island. I think it's about 10, 12 miles around. And that's where they kept uh, uh, 80,000 North Korean prisoners were there. Living in barracks, had beds to sleep on, sheets, where we were sleeping on ground or canvas. And we parked our tank up on a hill so we could look right down on the, all the barracks down there and see the guys playing baseball and volleyball. And, and every day we'd come down with the tank and drive around, all around the compounds, and all, back up and park on the hill. That's all we did. And during that time I was on the island, <clears throat> they started this, uh, this prisoner exchange. And, uh, and I was looking on here at uh, 19th of March, 1953, we were sent to the Kojido Island, and the other company went to, uh, other tanks went to another island where the Chinese were, and they had about the same amount of prisoners there. And they started a prisoner exchange. When they started the prisoner exchange, they start they bring they bring these uh, LSTs in, and they start loading these. Well, these guys wouldn't go. They had a, I don't know how they got them all on the ship because they didn't want to go. You know, they was afraid. Well, they had a maid there. You know, they had three meals a day, and they played sports all day. And we used to go down and get a few to come back and do some work, tidy up around the area, the tank, and clean up and. Well, they wouldn't do that. They'd lay down. They'd lay them out on the ground and lay there, and they wouldn't do nothing, so we'd help them. We're not allowed to touch these guys. We only have, we're given only so many shells, and you have to count for every one of these. If one of them is missing, they want to know what happened. Who'd you shoot at? Or, you, or whatever, because we're not allowed to shoot them. They lay on the ground, and so we call down to uh, the uh, compounds, and they come out. These guys uh, come out with the white helmets on them with the ball bats. And see, this is how, but we were smart, you know. We didn't, we didn't do any of the beating. That was South Korea. So they beat these guys with these ball bats. They didn't do it there. They, they got them in the truck and hauled them in the compound, but we were sitting up on the hill. We, I could see them. I, I could see the compound real well. Man, these, <laughs> these guys wheeling them ball bats. They really beat these guys, you know. But, you know. Then they started the prisoner exchange, and them guys wouldn't go. And, and, uh, and it was always at night they'd done this. Start, they got, tried to get the wounded out first, and so we can get our POWs back. And uh, then they start to take, they want to get them all out of there and send them back, you know, change, exchange the prisoners so everybody got back to where they're supposed to be without sitting in a camp somewhere. And our prisoners are getting nothing, you know, like these guys got. They were just starving and everything else, so. Prisoners of war contributed greatly to the peace negotiations during the Korean War and were also a huge part in signing the armistice. When Joseph Stalin passed away, the tension between North Korea and South Korea lightened. By March, China and North Korea had agreed to a wounded prisoners exchange demanded by the UNC. This prisoner exchange became known as Operation Little Switch. It began on April 20th, 1953 and lasted until May 3rd. The results of this operation were that 684 people were returned to the United Nations and 6,908 were returned to China and North Korea. The deal that followed was named Operation Big Switch, which was a signing of the armistice by both sides. Including the switch, 12,773 prisoners were returned to the UNC and 75,823 prisoners were returned to the demilitarized zone. Those who did not wish to return to their home country were held for 90 days by the Neutral Nations Repatriation Commission, established by the Armistice. 
While they were being held, the government of their home countries would attempt to persuade them to return home. Operation Big Switch begins to have tangible results on the home front as a naval transport bearing 407 Korean prisoners of war docks at San Francisco amid scenes of emotion. Next ashore is Sergeant Harry Borey of Philadelphia, who is greeted by Generals Lewis and Glasgow. The joy of reunion dominates the whole pier as fathers, mothers, and wives embrace men, some of whom had been given up for lost. For the returning soldiers, it is the end of a long, dark night of suffering and loneliness. For the scores of relatives, it is the end of a nightmare of waiting and uncertainty. It is the answer to their prayers. Our boy is home again. And uh, we left there, just as started that exchange, we left there and we went back up on the front line and we ended up way over on the Yellow Sea. You could see the Navy firing shells. Uh, onto the uh, <clears throat> on the mainland, and, and we never encountered a Russian tank. I think they were too big because they were a big tank, you know, and the roads weren't the roads weren't wide enough for these tanks. And we come back, we had to go through Seoul to get there, and uh, and Seoul, yeah, every time it comes a river with a tank, you have to go down through the water, and you you have to. Uh, you can't be over uh, five feet deep because then it'll come in and on the, come in on the driver because his hat, he's the lowest man in there. And, and if you close your hat, you still, you're gonna get water, so. But I, didn't like, I never liked driving with my hats closed because I got, I was claustrophobic in the first place and being that, phew. <laughs> so I always kept it open the crack rather than try to look through that periscope, you know. And you have to turn the periscope it's look in and it comes out up here. I didn't like driving that way because uh, uh, I took my chance with my head out a little bit. You can dare stick your head out of the tank or walk around too much because you get snipers that shoot you. All those pictures I took were from a, a box camera. You had to look down, so you're taking a picture, you had to, you had to stand up. I mean, uh, I don't know if it worked, I had, if I took it this way, because I, I stuck my head out of the tank one day, taking a picture, and I heard zing, sniper shot at me. And I, whoa, down I went in the head. <laughs> then I stuck, I stuck my helmet on, a, on, my, uh, on my carbine and held it up, just held the helmet up, let them know I was still alive, because they didn't get me. <laughs> But I turned my lesson there. I didn't take many pictures on the front line. There's a few on there, but not very many. I think we only asked like, well, that's about three in our, in our company. But, uh, being in a tank and um, one guy was going to go home the next day, and he got sniper got him. So, oh yeah, no, they they fired whenever the they felt like they wanted to fire, they fired. You know, it was not much during the day at all. Yeah, uh, it's always nighttime. You know, you can hear a lot of uh, firing. They they especially if you're going down to eat to the mess. You know, when they. They knew you were going to eat. They lobbed in those mortar shells or, or artillery shells, and they, man, you can hear them coming. They go, <laughs> and everybody has to dive for the ground. So I go, boy, oh, this is a bunch of baloney. I'm not coming down here no more. You know, I was fortunate that war, the war was kind of, it was being stationary at that time. We weren't trying to push. You know, uh, I don't know how you could push in those hills with a tank because, you know, it's just, it's just real, real hilly. We never seen any, there, there's supposed to be some M46s in Korea, but I never seen them. And they were, must have been in some flat ground around there, somewhere they, where they were using But And I could hear the Russian tanks over there. Never seen them, but they had that, they had a huge weapon on them. They used it for artillery, so. Uh, so, <clears throat> so I could, we got to Seoul, and it was heading up to the, the Yellow Sea. Or the Japanese Sea, and 
And we had to cross across this bridge because water's too deep there. So we had to go across this old cement bridge. So, and we, they told us, and I was always the second tank through because I was in the first platoon. And we had to line up on this, get lined up on this bridge. And they told us, don't touch your laterals to do any twisting. It's because you, you steered your tank with two sticks. You had to break one side and stop this track. And, they, and it's don't touch your lateral. Get lined up perfectly straight. And don't touch the laterals because and everybody in the tank had to get out except the driver and go across this bridge as slow as you could go. And don't, and, and the bridge was shaking. So, and I was the first one across. I don't know what happened when the 18th got across there, but, but that was the only way across that river. So then we uh, got up to where we were going on the, on the, uh, on the, maybe on the right side of the island. I don't know which direction that would have been. I think it's probably east. And we was up there, and I was up on it. We had to drive the tank up this hill, and man, it was a terrible, a terrible hill trying to get up. The road was back, back and forth, back and forth. And finally got up on the top, and there was a, a slot for us. We parked down in this, and saw a sandbag down the side. So you're pretty well protected, except the turret is out. And you always paint, when you're on the front line, you always park uh, so you can see another tank. Because during the night, if these, uh, especially the Chinese, they climb all over the tank when you're in there. And so you have to fire at each other with the 50 caliber on, on top or the 30s. And the, and the turret is a 30 plus uh, the 76 millimeter. Well, you don't shoot a 76 because it's smaller at a tank. You've got to shoot the smaller weapon. So you shoot the 50, and there's two of them up on top. And, uh, and the guys crawling out there, they can't use the 50, so you have to use the 230s. Or if, or if nobody's on your tank, or it's on the other tank, then you shoot your 50s at them. Because 50 won't hurt a tank neither. It might put a little dent in it, but. And that's the idea. Always, always park with somebody in the room so you can protect each other. Uh, and then um, that's when I got uh, told I was going to go home. So I was thinking, boy. I'm glad I don't take this tank back off this hill, because because I don't know how in the world they're going to do it, and I didn't have to worry about them. The ship was coming in with some new you know, replacements, and they got somewhere it got hung up somewhere, and they they come back and said, "Well, the ship's going to be a month, three three to four weeks late, and we'll send you back on the front." And so now he sent me back on the front. <laughs> All of us said, oh, "We're not going." We're not going back up there and get shot. So we, they, we, we stayed there about three, four weeks before the ship got in before we got on to go home. We all got on the ship and it took uh, 16 days to get home from Korea home to San Francisco. Oh, on the way home, I think we were two, two days out at sea and the war ended. I worked at Ingersoll probably for, I started in 50, I got out of the service, 53, and, and she was working at some uh, dress shop in Rockford. She's from Ottawa, Illinois, and uh, she left the dress shop, she came to Ingersoll, and she was on, uh, working down on the payroll. Uh, uh, and so the checks were made out there, and she kept, uh, she wondered who this guy was that, I bought a hundred dollar war bond every payday. And uh, and I don't know how it, uh, anyway, she found out who I was, I could be bold. And I found out who she was, and the next thing I know, I started getting my, the boss to bring my paycheck out is uh, in a sealed envelope like everybody's. So uh, anyway, I kept, the boss said, come on, he said, this must be your check. So to hold out, hand up, he had, he always put perfume on it. <laughs> <to> smell <laughs> so we saw uh, Rick Bowley uh, and the uh, got to know her and 
started dating. And, and before I went to go overseas to work, uh, the first time uh, I was single, 30, I think I was 30, 31 then, 32. And I gave her engagement rings, so I wanted to make sure she was here when I got back. Because <laughs> I wouldn't expect to be gone that long, so I was gone a year. And I come back, and then they're going to send me back overseas to another job. Fin fin go back to that job in Germany, then go to England and work and do the same job, setting up machines to be able to walk. So I'm, man, that'd be another year probably. So uh, I think I'm gonna, before I go, I says, uh, just give me time enough to get married. And then she went. went we didn't have a place to live in. I said, well, I did have a, I did have a duplex in Rockford, so I mean, I, mean, I had a place for, if we got. But so I said, well, you go, just come with me. <clears throat> and you can see some of the world, you know. And so she did. So, so we was gone another. We came back. I had airplane tickets to come home, and I took them. We took them down to uh, the old Queen Mary. We're still sailing. I traded them in for the uh, a ride home on the Queen Mary before it went to uh, San Diego for a museum. So that was an experience. So and uh, so that's we've been married for 51 years now, and we have a special son that was born. There are two daughters and a son. He's in the middle. He was born uh, Down syndrome, and he was only expected to live to be eight years old. And they kept predicting what's going to happen to him. My wife, I really upset my wife. You no, know, you don't do that. You know, doctors don't do that. You predict his life like that. So. Uh, we brought him home uh, and uh, raised him like any other child. But he's been a wonderful boy. I tell you, he's still he's 46 years old now. Lives at Milestone. My wife and I and another three couples started that place. That 45 years ago. So we got 400 kids there now. Well. I know one thing, and uh, my wife and doesn't understand this, that I, uh, whatever I've given on my plate to eat at a restaurant or whatever, I've never, ever complained about food. I've seen kids that are so hungry over there. There'd be no clothes on their bellies, way out, and just begging for food, and we didn't. You get caught doing that, and you're, you, get, you get in trouble, so. They, get, they go through that garbage can and eat orange peels. They were, yeah, these kids are starving. That's one thing I really learned. I, I don't complain about food. Never, ever, and never will. No. My name is Kara Fudge. I'm a senior at Harlem High School, and I am a part of the Harlem Veteran Project. I chose to uh, take vet doc because I have a few family members who have been in military service and I thought that by taking the class it would give me a little bit more insight into things they experienced and what they went through. Going into the class, the teachers did say that um, by the end of the year, once your doc's all finished, you'll, it will be like amazing and you'll feel so accomplished. And that is actually very true because you put so much hard work and effort into it throughout the whole, entire school year and then by the end, you feel so accomplished when you're done with it and like you have a million pounds lifted off your shoulders. The first time I met Richard, I did not know I was going to meet Richard. I knew it was a possibility that I would meet him because we were holding the annual uh, Vet Doc football game. It's our fundraiser we have and a lot of the students, vets do come to it, but there's not like a for sure thing that your vet's going to be there. So I was hoping he would be there and he was there and I got to meet him and I was pretty nervous and I got, I got to meet him and his wife actually and after uh, we were done doing all the things for the fundraiser I got to sit down and talk to them a little bit more and got to know them more on a personal level, level rather than just uh, hearing him talk on a screen. So it was a pretty cool experience because you sit at your computer every day in class and you are watching this person talk to you and then meeting them in person is kind of like a surreal moment, like they're actually real, they're not just on the computer screen. Um, meeting Richard, uh, after I met him, 
he was everything I thought he was going to be and more. He was very kind to me, and so was his wife. And I was very happy after meeting him, and I was looking forward to getting to meet him again. The most important thing that Richard taught me through this experience is to not take anything for granted and to always be thankful for what you have because you never know who has it worse than you, and you never know if there will actually be tomorrow. My most memorable experience about Vet Doc is building friendships with a lot of the people and these are some of the friendships that I'll never forget and I'll cherish for the rest of my life. I think that Richard is too humble to say it himself, but I really do think that he is a hero. He's very courageous and kind and caring and I want to thank him for his service and for accepting me into his life and letting me be a part of his story so I can tell it to future generations.